Cool. Okay, so uh, we're talking about Phoenix today, and uh, the title of the talk is Phoenix Takes Flight. I really love alliterations, so um, forgive me for that. But uh, today we're talking about where Phoenix came from like, the last seven months since ElliptiConf US, and uh, kind of where we're going. Uh, so if those of you that don't know me, uh, I created Phoenix. I uh, work at a company called Dole Lines. Uh, we do web design, web developments, and I am taking us into uh, Phoenix development. Uh, so check us out. I can't give a talk without mentioning uh, Metaprogramming Elixir. I uh, authored this, uh, came out just a couple months ago with Pragprog, uh, so check that out. It was a lot of fun. And uh, feel free to gloss over on this slide, but I was just like trying to list what we've done in the last six months, and it's like a crazy amount. Like I, like, the amount of stuff that we've added just since ElixirConf US has been uh, insane to look back on. Uh, so most of the talk today is kind of going to go over those features. I think, I think a lot of people aren't even aware of where we've been. Uh, some people make comments online, like I checked Phoenix out in September last year and it wasn't quite there and it's, it's like light years ahead. Uh, so we'll kind of go over that. Uh, we have generators for kind of getting started quickly. We have uh, this nice uh, concept of router pipelines to group your middleware kind of a nice separation of concerns. Uh, we had this concept of endpoints, so I'll talk a lot about how I designed uh, this monolithic system, and then uh, Jose came in and said, all these things are global, we need to make them not global. Uh, so I'll talk about how endpoints come out of that and things I've learned uh, coming into the uh, kind of uh, OTP mindset. Uh, we added a nice uh, protocol layer uh, for modeling. Uh, so we have Ecto integration by default, but it's just protocol driven, so if you want to bring your own model layer, it's just like, it's like 50 lines of code, you implement a couple protocols and all your forms and your links just work. Uh, form builders are in with that. Uh, we now can use a Phoenix a new task through a mix archive so it's easier than ever to get started. Uh, we added channel transport adapters which made channels a lot more extensible. Pub sub adapters to work on Heroku and uh, cases where you're not using distributed Elixir. Uh, long point fallback which has become a huge pain in the butt for the core team. But it's, it was really needed. Uh, people needed that for old browsers and for weird proxies, uh, so that's in place. Uh, we have static asset building, uh, which I'll go into. Uh, live reload, so we focused on like the development process. So it's been really nice that we solved a lot of like the core, what do we need to get done, and we focused a lot on like developer tooling, just like Elixir, where it's like it, it should be a great experience to develop your Phoenix applications. So I'll kind of give a, a nice demo of that. And just recently, we added test helpers. So just like your development experience should be really nice, your test experience uh, should be easy, and we should promote, promote good tool tooling. Uh, so test developers actually like, like just like a week and a half ago, like I think I was on the plane and Jose added some, some nice features. Uh, so I'll kind of go over those. Uh, so this is our current 1.0 milestone list. Like there's not much there. Uh, we're actually very close to a 1.0 release. Uh, I didn't want to give any dates, um, but like sometime in July this year, I think we will be confident enough that didn't coincide with Elixir on purpose. That's just something like Elixir 1, 2, and Jose was thinking July, but we'll probably both be wrong on both sides. So, But just to say, there's really no uh, massive changes. I think that unless we find uh, some things that aren't working quite well, um, we just want to add uh, some, some massive features like channel generator. Uh, channel authentication is kind of one of the bigger ones, but as far as implementation-wise, it's, it's not going to be too bad. We just want um, to provide an easy way to do uh, token authentication, so we don't leave that up to the user. Uh, channel test helpers as well. Uh, Unify long polar because long polling has made uh, my life sad, uh, but that's just a way to um, kind of we're special special casing long polling with channels, and we kind of want to have a unified interface for that, and it will solve a lot of problems. It will clean the code up, and then we want to focus on extracting some of these things to keep the core of Phoenix uh, nice and slim. And uh, with that, I've always promised we'll have iOS and Android channel clients. Uh, we have uh, an Objective C and a Swift library that uh, will be ready. Um, so I'm assuming we'll, I'm assuming someone will step up and write the Android client. So I say we'll have it, but I don't plan on writing it. So if you have an Android experience, please contact me. But I think hitting those, the browser and most mobile platforms, uh, will will really accelerate Phoenix. And I think it's it doesn't take much code to write a channel client. So I think we'll hit all major platforms and it'll be kind of a really nice thing to get outside of just the browser but have all these things uh, communicating. So I can't talk about Phoenix without talking about uh, the people behind it. Uh, it's uh, much bigger than me and uh, 
Phoenix wouldn't be what it is today uh, without the people here. Uh, so uh, Jose was kind enough in September to hop on board, and uh, he's written like like thousands of lines of code. So Phoenix is very much um, his his um, labor of love as well, and I'm super uh, grateful for that. Uh, Eric. Uh, Creator Hex hopped on board recently too, uh, added X domain support for channels, which, um, you know, to support older browsers, and like that's, that's not a very fun thing to do. Uh, so we need to really pay Eric some nice gratitude because he's done these things that are like thankless, like, you know, the package manager, X domain support, like these aren't necessarily fun to implement, uh, but they're, they're needed. Uh, so I really appreciate that. I think we should really thank him. Uh, and we have Sonny Scroggin and Jason Steves as well. Uh, they couldn't make it today, uh, but they, they have been a great help. And uh, we can't mention uh, the Phoenix team without mentioning uh, Lance Olderson. He's uh, the person behind the Phoenix Guides. Uh, so he's written uh, almost all of the Phoenix Guides. If you've been to phoenixframework.org, um, that's his, his work for the last several months. Uh, so he asked me at ElixirConf US uh, how he could help. He said, Phoenix looks really cool. And I told him, we really need guides. And I just don't have the time to do them. So he's like, oh, that sounds cool. I'd love to help out. And he, he later told me he was thinking like it was going to be multiple people behind the guys. Um, <laughs> but it's, it was just him, to his surprise, <laughs> after he committed. So, so it turned into months of work, but it's, it's uh, super important. So you know, just like the uh, Phoenix core team committing code, like that's a huge help. Like having someone put learning material together in the guides is just as important as contributing code because onboarding new people, having them learn the concepts is critical to Phoenix's success. So if you see him or any of these people today, give them a big thank you. Uh, so we'll talk about some new features. Uh, you can easily install Phoenix now with this huge URL, but it's way better than cloning a URL. You used to have to clone Phoenix from GitHub, build it, run a mixed task in one directory. Now you just copy and paste a command and you can run mixed Phoenix new anywhere on your system. <coughs> And uh, with Elixir 1.2 or 1.1, 1, 1, uh, it'd be even easier. Mix our pep install hex Phoenix and you're done. And then mix Phoenix new from anywhere in your system. You don't have to worry about uh, anything else and it just generates a Phoenix out. So easier than ever to get started. Uh, router pipelines, like I talked about, uh, they allow a scoped, group of, scoped groups of plugs. And plugs like a nice uh, middleware abstraction that's just functions. So it's this really nice high level middleware, but it just composes nicely as function definitions, and it allows uh, like a clear separation of concerns. So if you're coming from like an object-oriented background, it's like our answer to inheritance on how do we build up these kind of inherited uh, transformations in middleware in like a same way. Uh, so I'll show you what that looks like. Uh, this is a Phoenix router, and if you notice, we have a, a pipeline macro, and we can now just scope middleware to say, okay, I have a um, browser. So things that are concerned with browser requests, I want to do things like fetch the session because I'm going to need to authenticate a user. I want to protect them from forgery, so I'm going to add CR CRSF cross-site request forgery protection. And these things are kind of expensive. So you know we could have an API pipeline that we say, you know what, we don't need to worry about cross-site request forgery. We don't need to fetch the session for an API. Let's make a set of middleware that we can just say, okay, my API routes, those can do the API things. My browser can do the browser things. And then we can just uh, scope that in our router and we can just pipe through uh, multiple middleware. So here we're using browser, but you can add a list. Uh, so in my applications, I have like a staff pipeline that handles like staff authentication. So I like to split things up really well and then just pipe through a series of these. And it gives you a nice at a glance look of like, what is the request life cycle? And it's something uh, that has worked really well for us. Uh, so generators, these are uh, a huge addition. I resisted them at first, and I'll talk a lot about my, my learning process on um, kind of thinking about features, because I think these are a huge uh, huge thing to onboard newcomers and teach them kind of the ways of Phoenix. Uh, so they just bootstrap your HTML or JSON uh, API, models, views, controllers, templates, uh, sets up some tests for you, it generates uh, ecto migrations, and like I said, it's just great for beginners to get up and running quickly. If you're Using Phoenix professionally, you're not necessarily going to be using the generators for everything, but to get started, it's really important. And I have to show a demo because to really drive us home. So I have a Phoenix app running here, and uh, we'll see what happens. But let's say I'm writing a, uh, I, we, we, we built a chat application for our workshop the other day. And let's say, you know, we're at like a $10 billion valuation, 
and we want to add like a blog feature to it and get to like $20 billion valuation, <laughs> let's do that. So I can put my bottom here, the bottom, here we go. Oops, sorry. You can say Phoenix, Phoenix uh, Gen HTML. Uh, this could generate an HTML resource, but we also say uh, JSON API is pretty popular, so we could generate you know a JSON uh, endpoint in your JSON views. Uh, but for now, we'll do uh, HTML. Uh, we're going to do a uh, blog post model. We can pluralize it, and then I can give some fields here for my schema. So I know a blog post is going to have like a body, which is going to be text, and uh, maybe a user ID, which is going to be the, an integer of the uh, post. So I can hit enter, it creates a bunch of files and it tells me uh, add this to your router. So I can copy uh, this uh, comment here and say, okay, I need to figure out what's going to be the best location to add uh, to my application router. And I'm in the Phoenix source code right now. There we go. Uh, so if I go into my router, I can say, you know what? I can just pop this in the browser pipeline because this is where I want the host to live. I save that. Go back over here. It tells me to run mix fdo migrate. And it migrated up a uh, migration file that it generated. And now I'm going to go back to the browser. So I follow those instructions. Here's my chat app, $10 billion valuation. I'm going to go to slash posts, and the server's not running, but we can run it. 15 minutes. 15, yeah. It's, investor demo just went down a little bit, but we'll bring it back. Okay, and now we've generated some uh, CRUD code, controller views, templates. I can create posts. I'm going to submit this, and like, oh my gosh, validation errors. So like, this isn't like crazy innovative, but we've seen this in other frameworks, but to get started for users to be able to come into this code, is super important, and uh, Jose did did most of this work, so uh, it's it's a huge addition. So I'm going to add like uh, what's your conf? Uh, my user ID is one. It persists that in the database, and we get a listing of messages. I can update it, I can delete it, and like it's crazy fast, even in development mode. Like it's it's almost crazy. Like sometimes you're like, there's no way that actually worked, and we're running in development. Like people on Twitter will tweet out when they're checking Phoenix out, like will benchmark it and they'll be like, look at these numbers, this is crazy. And then I'll find out that they were running in development mode, which is like like over 10 times slower than, than production. And like it still blows their mind. So it's cool, it's cool to see that. Um, so that's generators. Uh, I think it's just it's really helpful to see uh, how that works. I won't go through the code, but for newcomers, they can check out those controllers and views and say, okay, this, this is the right way to do things. Like I said, you're not gonna just, you have to write code. The goal is not to just like, hey, we can just run mixed tasks. The goal is to say, okay, this is the best practices, and we kind of give a hint to the user, like, here's how you do things. So that's generators. Uh, we added uh, static asset handling with Brunch, which is a Node.js project. So before you like throw things at me, uh, it's optional. And uh, the way we integrated it is you can swap it out with anything you want, but uh, it just works. Um, Jose and I spent like in a horrible number of hours evaluating different Node.js build tools. There's like there's a lot, like there's a, there's, I don't know, I can, I can name them all, but there's a lot. Like I have like, like dozens and dozens of hours, I'm not kidding, like this was the least favorite part of Phoenix. But these problems have been solved and they've been solved well, so instead of spending a year of my life working on reinventing the wheel for uh, Node.js dependencies and still having to use Node.js anyway, because if you want to compile anything, you have to use Node.js pretty much. So, we would just drop Brunch in, uh, you don't have to think about it, it just works. If you have Node installed, it's super fast. And uh, by default, we have SAS and ES6 support. Uh, so ES6 is the uh, ECMAScript 6, it's the latest specification, specification of JavaScript. And uh, there's no reason to not use it today. Uh, it will transpile it to ES5, it will work in all major browsers, uh, super old browsers if you add a polyfill for certain things, and it adds things that you would expect a language to have, like. Uh, modules are finally like solved. Like there's one way to do modules. I can import socket from Phoenix. I can do things like a uh, destructuring assignment. Uh, it's not like pattern matching, but you can see here I can at least pull the messages off uh, the JavaScript literal without having to uh, kind of mess around with that. And, and look at this string interpolation. Like wow, but that's a huge deal. Like if I use a 
if I come to a language, like if I have to actually write code professionally and it's like and I have to like concatenate strings together, it's like what is this? I don't I don't know, I, I don't know. So so even if ES6 was launched and I had to transpile just for string interpolation, it would be worth it to me, but it has all this other cool stuff. So use it in Phoenix, you don't even have to think about it, you just write ES6 and it compiles for you. And we have pretty errors. Elixir.conf US, we had like, I rendered like a text thing, like something went wrong, and, like here's what we think the stack trace was. And now we get like nice pretty errors. You can click through the stack trace and you can see the code on the right for, oh, there's a line of code that raised boom. So that's nice. We had a live reload, which I have to demo because it, it's just super nice to kind of drive home with the developer experience. And we're using channels for this. So we kind of dog fooded our own um, secret sauce to add this nice, nice development feature. Uh, so if I head over to my application and try to make this fit on one screen, I'm going to edit my EX templates that are listing the posts. So this is the uh, post uh, index, maybe, somewhere. There we go. So we can see we're listing posts and we want to edit this to say uh, showing posts. Save, and like instantly it updated on the right, I didn't have to refresh. Uh, so pretty cool, great. Right? Yeah, and we're using uh, Erlang, uh, there's a FS library that is actually using a uh, file system events. So we're not like um, pulling the file system, this isn't gonna like eat up your CPU while you're running in development. Uh, it just works. And these are things that like, we added the ability for like real-time communication. So I hadn't planned to do live reloading, but I was just thinking like, oh, we have channels. Let's just set up, uh, when you load the page, I set up a little, uh, I inject, I parse the in-body tag and I just inject a little JavaScript snippet. And then we just broadcast if the file system changes happen. It's like a tiny amount of code. So like there's really neat things that I can't even think about that having this like real-time communication at your fingertips kind of uh, enables. So and this is gonna work for your JavaScript and CSS also. So if we go into our uh, static assets, I have uh, you know this page here, and I want to make it more like elixir, I can say background purple. I'm gonna Say it, and we have a purple background. So it's just really nice developer experience, and you know, it's going back to any of my other frameworks that I use. It's just like they don't have this, or I have to add it myself. So it's just it's been really fun to focus on kind of some of these nicer features now that we've solved uh, a lot of the other problems. So that's live reload. It just works, and it's a lot fun. It's going to work for your JavaScript as well. So uh, we're going to talk a lot about channels. Uh, channels are why I'm standing here today. Uh, it's why I came to Elixir. It's why I made Phoenix, because I didn't find this in any other uh, language that I was using. Uh, so channels allow trivial real-time messaging for connected devices, is what I say. So I'm a web developer. I'm from mainly a web background. But we have a lot of uh, different devices now. I think you know I'm kind of biased. I, I really like writing uh, web browser applications, but we have this, uh, we have iOS clients, Android clients, smartphones, smart devices. We can't just say we're a, we're a traditional web framework. We have to be able to connect to any client and then we provide just services to them. We can send messages to them, we can connect them all together. Things I do on my phone should show up on the web browser and vice versa. Uh, so this is a common problem for any, any iOS app. You know, they're going to have, you're gonna release a, any startup's gonna have iOS app, Android app, the browser app, and there's no reason why I can't write one backend to push out updates to all of them. I shouldn't have to write multiple applications. Uh, so we also uh, recently abstract the transport layer. Uh, so this is a big addition. Uh, we provided like the, it was just WebSockets at Lipsacomp US, but now it's uh, WebSocket long polling, but it's also anything else you want to bring. Um, you know, these are over HTTP, uh, but I can, I can foresee if someone wanted to have a message queue uh, like Redis or RabbitMQ, they could create a channel transport that instead of going over WebSockets, it could just uh, push a message on Redis, and then you could enqueue and dequeue messages back and forth, but the channel code you write is abstracted. It's all the same, like we're just dealing with a socket, and uh, so I'm interested to see where this goes. Uh, and we also abstracted the serialization format, so we provided extension points. It's JSON by default, but if you want some uh, more performance, you can go with message pack or some more advanced serialization format for like gaming. And uh, we also did a big uh, PubSub uh, rewrite internally to kind of broker messages across our Elixir nodes. And this was for people running on Roku or not running distributed Elixir. 
Uh, so it was a big deal for us to have those pubs of events go across nodes. So we added an adapter a system there. And we added even more to channels. Uh, so now they're isolated and they run in their own process. Uh, we can thank uh, Eric uh, because I resisted the handle info at first to make them isolated. I didn't think it was a good idea, but I can't imagine having not done that now. It, uh, it's really powerful. And it's, we also support synchronous messaging. So if you want to do a request response style messaging, uh, find out what happened on a specific message that you sent to the server that's in place now. Uh, we added outgoing message filtering. So ElixirConf US, you can just process messages coming in from clients. Now when you broadcast over PubSub, each client connected, uh, you can actually have a callback run for each client to customize that message. So I might want to append some client-specific information or I might want to drop messages. If a client has different preferences, maybe they only want to receive certain kinds of messages, we can now do that. And uh, it more closely mirrors the Gen Server API which initially I didn't think was important, but it's, uh, it's been a big learning process. Um, as I built out Phoenix to say, like, uh, Erlang has solved a lot of these problems already. Like, a lot of this, like, this client server stuff, like, it's called Gen Server for a reason. And uh, I didn't, like, get that at first. So I resisted a Gen Server API, and then I ran into, like, race conditions and problems and discovered, like, oh, a generic server API makes sense for this. That's just, it's been an interesting uh, learning experience. And uh, we have long polling, like I mentioned. Uh, so, we have uh, channel routes, which you've probably seen, uh, but for those at home or haven't seen Phoenix, your router routes things uh, other than just traditional web requests. So we only support HTTP uh, trans channel transports by default, but if I had that Redis message queue, it would still be processed through my router. So your, the idea I had with routers in Phoenix is they route traffic into your application, regardless of where that's coming from. So it goes from this just HTTP, uh, path, uh, request path thing to, I have just messages coming into my app, I want them to go to a controller or to a channel, and uh, this works. And uh, I talked about channel transports already, so I'm going to uh, skip this, but you can do some neat things like maybe add a webhook transport where someone can subscribe to a channel uh, by posting to your API, we can give them a token back, and any message that comes out for them over channels is going to be actually just a webhook back to your third party application. I stole this slide from Jose, I gave the Phoenix talk, uh, but it's uh, really important. So if we look at how channels work from the outside, this is kind of uh, the, the broad view. It's like we have uh, Phoenix powered uh, applications running, those are clustered together or talking to each other over PubSub, and we have different devices connected together over different transports. So I might have a browser on one, connected to one node over a channel, and it's going over long polling. It can broadcast messages uh, to anyone else listening on other nodes, and they might, those are there to receive them on your browser over WebSocket, on your iPhone over WebSocket, or an embedded device. So we have this Internet of Things movement, uh, there's a protocol uh, called CoAP, which is nice for like, kind of embedded devices, a lot of uh, smart devices are using it. So if someone wanted to write a CoAP transport for Phoenix, it would just work and your channel code on the back end remains the same. You no longer have to worry about how is this client connected, you just worry about how do I send messages back and forth. But the cool thing is, like, if we look at what Erlang was designed for, like they, they wrote a whole language for a reason. They, they needed to solve a specific problem. Let's, let's just rename these labels and then like, like mind blown, like it's the same problem, right? Like the modern web, the way we're building these connected devices, like it's the exact same problem that Erlang had to solve, you know, decade, a couple decades ago. So they had a couple switches connected distributively, and they needed to collect, connect these phones together, right? It's the exact same problem. And you know, our devices and our clients have gotten a little smarter, and uh, that's all that's changed. So it's really cool to see that you know this, this problem was solved, and this is why I came to Elixir, and this is how channels work so well because these these systems are deployed out there, and they can run like millions. Of connections. So uh, I'm interested to see how, how many connections we can get on uh, Phoenix. So I should have some benchmarks hopefully sometime soon, but I think you know many, many thousands of connections definitely should be possible because these, these problems have been solved and, and solved really well. And if we look inside on channels, yeah that works, we can see uh, how they work. So on the client, I can say socket connect to create this abstracted socket connection. Uh, it could be long polling, it could be web socket, and I get one connection to the server and we multiplex that. So you can have multiple channels running 
on uh, your back end, and those each, all, those each act like they have their own connection to the client, but it's multiplexed over a single one. And the nice thing is, we dispatch at the transport level into those channels, we then broadcast over PubSub back to other uh, channels, and then back into that single connection and send it back to the client. And then our PubSub layer can PubSub over just PG2, which is Erlang Standard Library. So by default, if you use clustering, you, you, just don't, you don't have to add any dependencies. But if you're on Heroku, uh, you can add Redis, and then we use Redis for PubSub. But you don't have to worry about it. Like it, it it's a, it's a one-line config change, and it just works. Uh, so we added some nice things for people not running distributed Elixir. Um, we definitely promote that as a default, uh, but a lot of people are on Heroku. A lot of people don't know how to set up these clusters yet, so I think you know, Redis was a huge, a huge addition. Uh, someone implemented this over Postgres already. So there's a Postgres PubSub adapter third party that if you're using Listen Notify and you don't want to add Redis but you're already using Postgres, you can PubSub over Postgres. RabbitMQ I've seen as well. And then we're talking with the uh, Mongoose IM folks about how can we add uh, XMPP uh, to do a lot of this. Because a lot of, they solve a lot of these problems over XMPP already. And Mongoose IM is, is known to, to solve these things really well. So, um, we've got a couple people, uh, Sonny uh, Straga on the Phoenix Core team, and a person uh, on the Mongoose uh, team uh, are just experimenting on you know, how can we integrate these and how could you maybe add some advanced features uh, at the pub sub level to, to connect these things. Uh, so I'm really just interested to see kind of where that goes. And uh, we can talk about pushing events. So we have this idea of clients push events to the server, Several servers have a callback to handle incoming events, and then they can push events back to the client. So we can see that the server or the client push ping, server process that in a callback, push palm back, and the client can then receive it and then run a callback. And then we have this other idea of broadcasting events. And this is where client pushes ping, we handle it in their uh, channel, handle and callback, and then they want to broadcast to everyone else uh, subscribed. And what happens in this case is we can now process outgoing events. So on a connected uh, client basis, all of them receive this handle out palm. Uh, by default, we just push it onto each client, but you can, you can implement your own handle out pattern match on that and say, okay, the first client, we can just push it back to them. They wanted to receive palm. Same for the second client, they receive palm. And then this third client is like, you know what? <clears throat> client one has sent ping so many times, I'm just gonna filter, I'm gonna drop this message. So it's a really nice way to push these pub sub events out and then filter or drop them. So you can imagine if I had some alerting system, I had a bunch of uh, sysadmins connected, maybe some only care about kind of critical alerts. You could add uh, a preference to the database. So then on, on broadcast in the system, this, you know, there's a CPU spike, that sysadmin would receive that. Um, maybe there's some lower level uh, error. Some other sysadmin might have a preference to say, nope, I don't want to receive that. But you handle that on a client by client basis. Uh, so it's, it's a really nice way to kind of filter these things. On the channel side, uh, we have synchronous <coughs> joins now, which kind of uh, resolve a lot of some race conditions that we had. And uh, we have this really nice way to do almost pattern matching in JavaScript. It's not really pattern matching, but you write it in a very similar way. And it's, it's been a big pleasure. Uh, so I'm going to go into another example very similar to this. Um, but the synchronous uh, messaging has allowed some, some interesting use cases that I hadn't even thought of. And uh, we have handle info now as well, like I mentioned, where I can just, just like a gen server, I can say, okay, after I've started up my process, I, I don't want to do anything before I initialize. Like, I'm not sure if this is going to start up successfully. And we had race conditions before. So now if you want to do anything uh, after the client's connected, you just send yourself a message, just like a gen server. And then I handle it in handle info, and I can push a feed of messages down to the client. Uh, so it solved a lot of issues, uh, things that I didn't even think of, uh, by kind of taking this feedback, acting on it, and realizing, like, oh my gosh, this was totally the right way to go. And here's the kind of uh, fake pattern matching. So, like, um, I, I received a lot of feedback on this, and spent a lot of time thinking about this API. Uh, from ElixirConf US, there was no way to send a message to the server and then actually respond to that, uh, get a response for that specific event. Uh, so now we can like we can get fake pattern matching, but like writing this, writing uh, JavaScript and next to my Elixir code is like actually a pleasure now, where normally it hasn't been. So like this is what channels for me are all about. I can push a message to the server and if I receive okay, just like I'm running Elixir code, I run a callback and I get the message. I can append it to my uh, chat application 
I receive error, I can just structure the error messages and then show the errors to the user. And then I can even say, hey, you know what? Just like processes, after a certain amount of seconds, I assume all of is lost, show a loader on the client because we have no idea what happened. Uh, so it's like we brought a little bit of Elixir to JavaScript and it's, it's really nice to write kind of back and forth. So if we show the client and server together, I can now reply directly. I have a handle one message, I want to persist it into Ecto. I can say, okay, reply, okay, here's your message. And then on the client, receive okay message. Like this is almost like Elixir. Same thing, okay, we could persist the uh, message, maybe there are validation errors. I can reply, hey, error. And then I can pattern match on the client, okay, we got an error, just structure the errors, show the errors to the user. So this is just a super nice way, super nice API to bridge your backend code to your client code. Talked about PubSub, so I'm gonna skip this. Uh, it just works, regardless of if you're using distributed Elixir. Uh, performance uh, has been super fast, so I, benchmarks are notoriously uh, tricky, uh, but this is someone put a bunch of benchmarks together. A lot of these applications are doing different things, like the gen application, was like one file that someone submitted where like the Phoenix application is like a whole Phoenix app. But we can see it plug still wins, so looks are fast. But no, I think if, if we check out, the cool thing about this chart is if you check out this plug example and Phoenix example, Phoenix is doing more work, but these features that we're adding on top of plug are not imposing like massive overhead. So if you take anything away from these benchmarks other than beating you know, Node and Ruby, it's that Phoenix is adding a lot of these nice features but not at the cost of like you know, killing your throughput for these nice productive features. We are really focusing on performance, uh, not at the cost of, uh, of uh, limiting your productivity. Uh, so we can talk about Phoenix 1.1. 1 .1. Uh, we've punted on some features for 1.0 because I think it's a smart thing to do, just like I think what Elixir did is we've said, we, we know these features are almost baked, we want to stabilize our APIs, get a 1.0 out, and then we can focus on what's next. So Phoenix 1.0 isn't going to be the end. Uh, we're kind of just getting started, but we have um, APIs in place. Like I said, we just want to make sure they're stable, release a 1.0, and then we can enhance that. Uh, so we used to have internationalization, but we pulled that out uh, because uh, Jose has started a new uh, Git text project. Uh, it's, Git text has been around for a long time, and we can do some really neat things like compile time in Elixir uh, to compile into uh, Git, test, Git text format. So it's going to be way better than what we had uh, before. Uh, another big feature uh, is channel uh, replay and being able to do last message ID. Uh, this is a, a notoriously difficult problem, and I'd like to see the interesting ways that we can solve it. But the idea is if I'm on my phone and I drive connected over Phoenix channels, I drive underneath the bridge, I want to receive those messages when I connect back when I get outside of the, the uh, tunnel. Uh, so today, you have to roll that yourself. Either you miss those messages or on reconnect, you have to add your own last message ID implementation. So I think. This is going to come up often enough that it's a problem that we can solve and hopefully solve uh, for a broad use case. And the same with channel presence. Uh, we talked with the Mongoose IAM folks, uh, XMPP solves a lot of these issues. Uh, so we're trying to see what's the best way to say, you know, who's on this channel? Because right now, you can just put it in an agent, but you have to roll your own code to say, when someone joins, spin up an agent in Elixir and say, okay, this person is joining this channel. When they leave, we have to remove them from the agent. It'd be nice to have that handled for you uh, automatically. And uh, Jose is going to work on uh, nested associations. Uh, so being able to send up a giant uh, list of form attributes, a giant uh, embedded list of uh, JSON uh, objects, and being able to have that build out uh, hierarchically. Because uh, right now you have to do that yourself. And uh, before you hate me, phoenix.flux is uh, something I'm experimenting with. Uh, I, I really like the uh, flux design pattern uh, out of Facebook. Um, it's like, it took like 100 lines of JavaScript. I have a little prototype. And it's just a really neat way to do kind of like reactive data flow based programming in JavaScript. Uh, so it's something that would just be an optional dependency, but it, I've prototyped out like a, a, a Gin server esque API in JavaScript, but using the Flux implementation. So it's a neat way that we can integrate channels with that and kind of have this same way to write JavaScript on the client and integrate in Phoenix channels. But I'm not sure. We'll see how it goes. Uh, and then a generic cache store, uh, it's just often enough people want to cache things. Uh, so it would be nice to say, okay, if you're on distributed Elixir, we can put it in an Eds table. If you're on uh, Heroku, let's put it in a Redis, but it should be a one-line configuration change. Uh, so there's 1.1. 1 .1. Uh, so I think beyond that, it's just get this out, get this stable, get people building interesting things with it. 
especially around channels. I think we'll see some use cases that will then kind of pave the way beyond that. But for 1.0 and 1.1, it, we don't have any crazy big changes. It's just let's get it stable, let's get people building cool things, and kind of grow from there. Uh, so lessons learned, I can talk about a little bit. Uh, avoid monolithic designs. My last several months of work have been like we had a global pub sub server before. So very little of our high level API change, but the design internally, everything was a monolith at first. We had global mix configuration, so we said, well, I, I didn't say, Jose said, this is terrible. Well, no, no, not Jose. Jose's too nice. Jose said, hey, this could be a little bit better. We could do it one way. <laughs> and we added endpoints, and the endpoints hold, a, hold your configuration and run the web server. So now you can run multiple endpoints in your Teams application, and it just works. But like nothing, we didn't have to sacrifice anything to get an extensible design. Uh, same with the PubSub API. It was a global gen server. You could only have one of them on your VM. It worked for uh, small cases, but then umbrella applications or anything, you can only have one of these. So it was a learning process for me. But the cool thing is, uh, the top-down design has worked well. I was like, this is the biggest open source effort I've been involved with. And if you remember from ElixirConf, I like Elixir because like, it allows me to do what if I could just driven development. And I wasn't sure how that was going to work out. Um, but the cool thing is, I wanted to do channels. And I wanted to write router in a certain way, so I said, here's the code I want to write, and I know Elixir will let me write code like this. I prototyped it internally, I had this monolithic design, global gen servers, but then we iterated. We made things better, we made things extensible, but the high level APIs remained just as nice. And that's worked out really well, so I'm not sure if that'll work out for everyone, but you know, we added transport adapters, pub sub adapters, all these internal things, instead of trying to start from the bottom, start from the top, and then figure out how to make it work and make it work well. Uh, so I want to close with talking about uh, the community. Figure out how much time I have here. Okay, doing well. So this is probably the most important part of the talk. Uh, the Elixir community is amazing. I don't have to tell you that. Uh, but I think it's super important to talk about you know, where the community goes from here and how to grow the community uh, successfully, which we've done a great job of so far. So I've, I've known that I've, I was going to give this talk for about a week and a half. So I gave a workshop. I didn't know I was giving a keynote. So surprise. Thanks, Jim. But no, so I've only collected, I've collected a few quotes that I found online, but it's only been for like less than two weeks. So I haven't been saving these for the last several months. It's just when I found out I was giving this talk, I was like, I want to really talk about the community, and I should start trying to find people talking about the community. So just keep this in mind. This is just over the last couple of weeks uh, that I found these things. And uh, let's, let's see a couple of them. So, Elixir is the first language where I managed to get an answer in chat before I figured it out myself. Like, this is super important. Like, if, I don't know if, you know, Toby in this case, maybe he had an hour to play with Elixir that evening. He just put his kids to bed. I'm not sure if that's the case, but it could be. It's definitely the case for a lot of people. If they received some weird error, they weren't sure what was going on, they didn't know how to solve it, they could have wasted that hour and their first ex experience with Elixir saying like, wow, I got nothing done, what is this language doing for me? But instead, they hopped on IRC, they got an answer right away, <clears throat> and then that hour turned into, oh wow, like I got help right away, that was fun, community is nice, and oh, I did pattern matching, I spawned these processes up, like, Elixir's really cool. So like, we took, what took someone two seconds to answer on IRC, could have made all the difference for someone staying and, you know, sticking with the language, telling their coworkers like, yeah, I played with this last night, like there's this crazy revelation that I had with you know what, what was possible. Uh, so this stuff is, is super important. And we see it over and over again. So someone else experimenting with Elixir and Phoenix, the community is very welcoming to those testing the waters. And like this is super important, uh, especially with newcomers. Like you feel like it's gonna take you years to become an expert. So you're less likely to seek help because you don't want to say, you don't want to feel dumb. You don't want to say, this code's not working. And you know, usually I'll ask people in IRC, like, can you just it? Just show me a gist of your code. Like I think for a lot of people initially, they're like, they don't want to share that because they're like, oh, my code's crap. I don't want people to see this code. So I think it's a, a big push and it's going to kind of help with the option for us to say, you know what, Be, we're welcoming. We're going to help people out, share your code. Um, I make stupid mistakes all the time and I've been doing Elixir for, for a while now. So I think continuing to push these ideas is going to uh, really help grow the community. And I have a couple more quotes because they're really great. So I have to say, from my first day of Elixir, the community is amazing. I agree, that's awesome. But this stuff is important. Another quote, as I said to someone yesterday, and I'll say it again, 
by far the most helpful community around programming language that I've experienced in a long time. Like, this stuff matters. And I think Jose has done really a fantastic job about kind of establishing uh, these memes in the community. So I think if we continue to be helpful, uh, collaborate, shut down intolerance, like we have a really bright future. And this is one of my favorite aspects about kind of this whole Elixir uh, journey in building Phoenix. It's all about working with other people, building cool things, sharing knowledge. So I will leave you with one more quote. Uh, the Elixir community is full of love. All I see is hearts these days. So if you've ever seen a pull request accepted from Jose or anything, any comment Jose ever makes online, lots of hearts. Um, that's how it should be, and I agree. So check Phoenix out, phoenixframework.org. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you, Jose. Thank you. Any questions? Not everybody wants. <laughs> no questions? I've got one, yeah. All right. Have you done any benchmarks on multi-core? Uh, and I mean, you know, trying it with two cores, four cores, eight cores, and so on. So not yet. So I think you talked about this at ElectroConf. Um, what I found, to my surprise, it's very hard to benchmark easily. Um, like benchmarking my Ruby applications has been like, just run it, run one laptop, pushing traffic to it, and it's, it's easy. But trying to benchmark uh, the Phoenix applications have actually been hard. Like, I needed multiple uh, hardware to actually max CPUs out. But, I, well, I, ha I haven't been able to max my cores. Um, Welcome to the airline. Yeah, so that's So no, the answer is no, I haven't, but only because um, I'd have to go like buy hardware to try to test these things. Like we, uh, we benchmarked a Heroku Dino, and uh, I ran it from a, another instance so I wasn't running it like locally over my home internet. I was running from a data center to benchmark the Heroku Dino, and we like the Heroku Dino CPU usage wasn't max. It was like 80%. So we ran out of network uh, network links on the uh, instance side, trying to push traffic just to a Heroku Dino, which are tiny. So it's like I, I don't know how to benchmark these things. So <laughs> if you have benchmark experience, I'd love to see something thorough. But it's it's been impressive. Yeah. So I got a question. Uh, yeah. Uh, has has Heroku sent you any cease and desist letters? <laughs> <laughs> well, we are kind of we are kind of ruining their business model of spinning up lots of dynos because like Hex runs on one dyno, and I think Hex will always run on one dyno. Like, I don't know that we could, uh, probably not. We'll probably need multiple. But yeah, the Heroku's business model is like dynos are relatively expensive, and usually you need a lot of them, but um, not with not with lasers. <laughs> Uh, one other question, so I've mentioned this before, but, uh, and, and I know it's a, it's a hard problem, but uh, the hot code or uh, live updates with me, yep. um, any plans on that, or have you guys even started looking at that? Yes, so I mean, obviously uh, we trumpet that, uh, we, have a, we have a talk today that's going to go over that, so that's like beyond my level of knowledge right now, but it's definitely something that we always you know, say, like, we have hot code uploading, like, you should come to Elixir, and then people ask me, how do you do hot code uploading? And I say, I don't know. Um, but, um, you know, it's just, there's only so much time that I have to focus on learning different things. So it's definitely something uh, that we should, we should be hot upload uh, compatible today. But as far as deploying that and handling that, it's not something I've had enough experience with yet. Uh, but definitely that's something that we want to focus on. And I think we'll, we'll see better tooling. We have, we have a talk today. Uh, they're gonna really talk about things that they built, uh, problems they've solved, and hopefully we can, uh, you know, share a lot of that and have uh, established ways to do this that are much easier. Any other questions? All right, thank you. We got it. Okay. Hi. Um, we already talked about this. Uh, so um, um, in our company, we try to um, implement kind of um, the client for a web uh, messaging um, web circuit client. So uh, this is when this kind of web application messaging protocol. It's a sub-protocol of um, web circuits. And uh, the nice part is you, know, you can implement a, it's a defined standard and you can implement it uh, with different technologies. 
so for instance, right now, uh, the main rotor implementation is in Python, and we think it's maybe not the best solution. Um, and it would be awesome, really, really great if <coughs> Phoenix, because it all already provides like channels, provide can provide in a very extended version something like session handling, authentication. You uh, already mentioned that. Um, can you see something like this on the roadmap, on the long roadmap? Yes. Yeah, so it's definitely like I said with top-down design. I think protocols are a good thing, um, but I didn't. I was looking at different ways um, these real-time communication systems were working. So I actually started with how can I do an implementation of the Fay protocol? If someone has experience with Fay, and that was going to be my starting point with channels, because then I wouldn't have to write a channel client, and uh, it would be much easier. But that actually like stopped me from being able to like make forward progress because a lot of these problems I wasn't sure that I even had at the time. But now actually having gotten to the point that we're at, um, I'm talking with the Mongoose so IM folks, talking with the, the WAMP protocol, that their XMPP solves these problems, uh, WAMP solves these problems. So for us, it's going to be how do we how do we bridge that gap? And for the WAMP example or XMPP, uh, Phoenix channels uh, abstract the transport layer. So my current thought is, I think the transport level is how we can bridge these things, um, but still we have to make the, uh, the message protocol that we're sending back and forth extensible enough. Um, but I think it'll be, it's going to be difficult to try to say, okay, let's do XMPP or let's do WAMP, and then still say, okay, you can add a transport adapter to connect over long polling, over, X, over XML, over Redis. So that's what my current thoughts are. I'd love to uh, figure that out because I think a lot of these problems have been solved well already, but how can we do that in a way that still gets all the nice stuff that we have planned so far? So let me know how that goes. But yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely in my mind right now, for sure. Cool, thanks. Can you elaborate something about test helpers? Because last time I checked, uh, I wanted to create some tests. There was a big pipeline, and I wanted to mock, for example, the authentication, fetching session, and something like that. Is, is it solved by test helpers? What do they do? Yeah, so depending on when you check Phoenix out, so we actually should have had a 0.12 release. Uh, I just didn't have time. Uh, I was on the plane when I think Jose added the, the most recent test helper uh, stuff. So yes, that's, uh, the test helpers aren't finished, but they're actually uh, really nice compared to what you, even if you checked a couple weeks ago. But we added a way to easily uh, test something through your endpoint, which can go through, which will go through your router pipelines. Uh, so you can just give it a route and it will process through those uh, plugs and you get the connection back and you can make assertions on it. Uh, so that's in place and uh, we'll have a zero twelve release probably uh, the next week and uh, hopefully I can add a good uh, example of that. Yeah. So uh, don't don't do that. Uh, don't <laughs> don't go in, with. I'm, I'm at inbox three hundred and eighty right now. So a lot of these are from Jose. So maybe go ahead. Yeah, don't don't go from mocks or try to avoid the, the the pipeline. Just have your requests doing the whole cycle. It's fast, right? It's not you can do literally ten thousand of those per second. That's not what's going to make your test. So just go through the whole thing, because that's really what I want to test. I want to be sure that you are going through the proper plugs or everything, and everything is going to be set up. Otherwise, you're going to be in a world of pain, and at the end, you're going to be testing whatever you're supposed to be testing. Yeah, so I can, I'll pull up a, uh, just one example of, uh, you can now just say, uh, I can use my connection case on line two, and I can just make it get to messages. And that's actually going to go through my endpoint, go through the pipeline that the route that the route match, and give me my connection back. So it's going to take that, walk it through your entire pipeline, walk it through the controller, render a response, and then you can assert. This. It was an HTML like you can get like three assertions in one. Was uh, this is what uh, Jose uh, came up with, which is really nice. So instead of having like to pull out the response headers, I can just say, was this an HTML request? Was it a return response? If it was, then return the body so I can assert on the content type of the response, the status, and the body in one go. So that's what we have right now, and uh, we'll add some other tools uh, coming pretty soon. Yeah. 
Anyone else? Yes, uh, I saw on the mailing list that someone was started playing with the transpiling Elixir to JavaScript. Is this something you're excited about to be able to code the front end and the back end? <laughs> okay. Um, if someone wants to solve that and solve it well and it's stable, it would be really cool to see what we could do. Um, but right now, it's definitely not one of my focuses. I think um, it sounds amazing. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. Like if, if it existed, like Closure Script, Closure Community has like. ClojureScript is like an officially supported thing. It's at like it's a stable release, so I think that would be amazing. Uh, but it's definitely not something I have time to pursue. Uh, so if someone wants to solve that, and then it would be it would be crazy to me to add like a, yeah a channel client and Elixir on the JavaScript side and see how that would work. Uh, so we'll find out. Maybe maybe in a couple of years we'll have something. We'll have uh, isomorphic apps, but we would not call it that. So. So I would never call Phoenix an isomorphic uh, web framework. So we'll, we'll have to come up with a better name, but we'll see. All right. Thank you.